uh, turn to Acts chapter 21. Uh, we're going to uh, follow Paul on into Jerusalem and uh, see his reception there with the, uh, the church. And uh, there's going to be uh, joy as well as some concern. And then his eventual arrest there on the, on the Temple Mount. And uh, like I say that, that video kind of sets things up enough to, just to say that uh, you know, sometimes we're in the middle of the story and uh, it, it looks pretty bleak, but it's just the middle of the story. And uh, God still has a has a plan. Uh, just introduce you to uh, somebody real quick. This guy's a Hall of Fame football coach, uh, Lou Little, coached uh, Georgetown in Columbia, uh, and tells a story while he was at Georgetown of a young guy that was a pretty average football player. He was actually only on the practice uh, 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 squad, uh, and he but he's talking about what a great kid he was and everything. And then and he would notice uh, on occasion his father would visit him and. Uh, they would kind of walk arm in arm through the campus, which he thought was a little unusual, but he never actually met his father. And, uh, and then came uh, news that his father uh, had had a heart attack, uh, and he went home. He was home for three days and for the funeral. They came back, and then they were getting ready to play Fordham, which is one of their big games of the years. And he, this kid came to him and said, uh, Coach, can you play me uh, in this next game? You know, that uh, I think that's what my dad would uh, uh, would want you to do. So he says, well, uh, I'll get you in the game. You know, even if it's just for a couple of plays, I'll, I'll definitely get you in the game. And uh, so the game time came and he decided he'd just go ahead and start him and just see how he did. And actually he played fabulous the whole game. He left him in the whole game. And afterwards he said, wow, you played like, a, like an All-American. You know, it's like, what, what got into you? Uh, and he said, uh, uh, he said, uh, remember how my father and I used to go arm in arm through the campus? That was because my father was blind. And today, for the first time, my father got to see me play. Now, we could argue the theology of whether that's even possible or not, but certainly that was in this young guy's uh, mind. And we'd say his desire to please someone he loves, someone not visibly present, made all the difference in the world. And that's, that's Paul. Paul's been warned over and over again not to go to Jerusalem. He's had the prophet Agabus come all the way up 60 miles to Caesarea, uh, take his sash, wrap it around his own uh, arms, and... Uh, and say, you know, that, you know, thus will happen to the man that owns this sash. You know, Paul's going to uh, be bound when he, uh, when he gets to Jerusalem. But Paul's like, hey, I'm, I'm willing to not only be bound, I'm willing to die for Christ. You know, and then we kind of, we talked about the idea, uh, there, the, the critics that would say, a uh, big mistake for Paul to go. These are warnings. Should, he should have heeded the warnings. Uh, I think we tried to make a good case for to say that, uh, uh, no, Paul was in the center of God's will. Uh, he was uh, warning him what, uh, what awaited him, what was going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but still, Paul was in the center of God's will. Uh, in returning, and we went through some of the reasons why that would be important that he did uh, in our last message. A couple, a couple other slides. So here's uh, uh, this whole thing's going to happen on the Temple Mount. So this, uh, this is first century uh, Jerusalem, the uh, Temple Mount, obviously kind of in the uh, top uh, middle up there. <clears throat> and you can see um, see the city of David to the right, which has um, been uh, tremendous excavation and uh, is incredible to visit today. Uh, Antonio Fortress uh, to the uh, to the left uh, corner of the Temple Mount. You can go into the next one, and that'll help us a little. So here's the the Temple now from another angle. Again, that top right, those uh, four towers coming up are all part of the uh, Antonio Fortress. Uh, and then I found this very old picture of it. It's not really an old picture. So in Jerusalem, there's a, there's a scale model made out of Jerusalem stone. It's very accurate uh, and uh, such a great uh, uh, way to look at the city in the first century. So in the back right, you can see one of the towers. Obviously, this is the uh, 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 in the temple. Again, the, the temple mount is several acres as it is today. Uh, you could invite your Gentile friends up to the temple. Uh, Mount area, <laughs> you could go over, and you could explain the scriptures, they could hear people teaching, they could learn about Judaism, <coughs> they could view and see the temple proper uh, from, uh, from that area, but of course as Gentiles they couldn't go any farther. There was the court of the women, there was the court of the men, uh, and then through those gates to the, uh, the large building there is where uh, only the priests could enter. You can go into one more slide, and you can see uh, again the back right, the four towers uh, that are the Antonio Fortress, because uh, that will certainly play uh, in our story uh, as well. well. Let's look at uh, verse 15 to 25, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem. 
we're seeing it's met with joy as well as uh, some concern. And after those days, we packed uh, and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went uh, with us uh, and brought with them a certain Manson of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were uh, to lodge. And when we'd come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders who were present. When he had greeted them, he told them in detail uh, those things which had God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to uh, the customs. What then? The assembly must uh, certainly meet, uh, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads uh, and that uh, they all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we've written decided that they should observe no such thing <clears throat> except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. So Paul's been waiting for the right time, hoping to get to Jerusalem to arrive by Pentecost. Apparently he makes it in time. Uh, according to Josephus, there could be as many as two million people that pack into the city for these three major, uh, major feasts. Uh, we note that, uh, again, disciples from Caesarea walked with them. That little walk was, uh, was 60 miles. Uh, and again, it just speaks to the fact that these, these people really love the Apostle Paul. They're very concerned of what uh, awaits him there. Uh, and we notice uh, of his arrival, it begins with a meeting with James and, uh, and the elders. Verse 17, the brothers received us gladly. Uh, there's apparently a, a meeting, and then they come back today with, uh, with the elders uh, so, some have suggested that uh, uh, the elders in that, uh, that early uh, church there were as many as 70, like the Sanhedrin. They developed something similar uh, to that. Either way, it's kind of an imposing group of, uh, of people that Paul is, uh, is uh, sharing these details with. Uh, he, we know he's already concerned about the, the leadership in Jerusalem and how things are going because he's already written to the church back in Galatia and described the problem that uh, when, when folks came from Jerusalem, uh, saw how they interacted in that church with, with the Gentiles. Uh, they basically were rebuking Paul, and Peter comes up, and Peter's been with the Gentiles and eating with them. Now he pulls back, and even Barnabas does, and, uh, and then Paul has to call them out publicly and stuff. Uh, and so Paul's well aware there's, there's some potential problems here as he, uh, as he returns. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the idea, and they received him gladly, was, uh, was a big deal and probably uh, brought a sense of relief to them. Now he shares a couple of things. One, he shares, again, verse 19, uh, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So that would have been all the things that we've been studying you know, over our past several, several months together on these missionary journeys. He would describe the riot uh, in Ephesus, uh, as well as the fact that it being a center for the occult, that as uh, men and women came to faith in Christ, they would bring their, their magic books and potions and so forth and burn them publicly, totaling uh, as much as $5 million in today's uh, uh, economy and so forth. A church on fire for the Lord, literally, uh, and having a huge impact there. He would have talked about what it was like to uh, preach at the area of there on Mars Hill and to uh, uh, try to reason the best he could with the, uh, the intellectuals of, uh, uh, of that particular city. And, Corinth, uh, the sensual center of the world, and how many people had come to faith in Christ, and he would have described all this in some detail. I don't know if we told him about the uh, the story of poor Eutychus uh, there in Troas, who Paul preached so long that he fell out the window and fell down and died, and Paul had to go down and pray for him. But these are the kind of things, uh, the things that we've gone through probably pretty quickly. Uh, Paul would have gone to, it says, in detail uh, and explained to them uh, the work that God had been doing uh, in and through them. Uh, the other thing uh, that is not mentioned that did happen, would have happened, is then Paul presents the offering. They've collected an offering from these Gentile churches, and uh, it was for a practical reason uh, in terms of uh, uh, there was a drought, uh, there was a famine, uh, there was the situation of 
uh, somebody coming to faith in Christ who's Jewish in Jerusalem. They're ostracized from their family, losing their home, losing their job, and so forth. So there was a need. So there was a practical need. Uh, but there was also what Paul was hoping that it would bring some sense of unity. Uh, that uh, this is how much they, uh, they, they care about, uh, uh, about you. And, uh, uh, and uh, it resulted in verse 20 is uh, they praised God. So uh, that part of the meeting has gone, uh, has gone well. Uh, and then uh, we'd say secondly, uh, this idea of the concern. Uh, and we're uh, kind of reintroduced to James, of course, here in verse 18. And we see that James has really, uh, very early on in that church in Jerusalem, uh, becomes, in a sense, the pastor, the bishop, uh, the head elder, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he seems to have the voice of authority in things. Uh, back in chapter 12, when uh, Peter's been arrested, uh, and then the angels uh, uh, release him, you know, remember in the middle of the night, uh, he goes to home, knocks on the door, uh, and basically uh, tells him, yeah, I've been freed, and says, go and tell these things to James and the brethren. It's always James and, and the brethren. Uh, in uh, verse uh, 19 of chapter 15, when they're having the council of Jerusalem, uh, trying to figure out what to do uh, with these Gentile converts, Peter gets up and says, well, I went to the house of Cornelius. I just simply preached the gospel, and God did the rest. It wasn't my fault. They just, you know, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Uh, they came to faith in, in Christ. Paul and Barnabas kind of throw in their two cents and so forth. Uh, there's a, a little clamoring back and forth. And then James gets up and kind of says, well, here's what we're going to do. Uh, verse 19, therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God. So <clears throat> James becomes this uh, very central a uh, very important person uh, in the early church, by the way, eventually martyred for his faith, uh, like, like the others, uh, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and the other thing to know about him is that he was well-respected among the Jews, well-respected, referred to as James uh, the Just, uh, seen uh, constantly in the temple, on his knees and praying and so forth. And so uh, he was a perfect guy because he, he had a tremendous reputation for his own, his own righteousness, his pietness, his, uh, his devotion to the Lord uh, that, uh, uh, that went a long ways towards uh, winning these Jewish uh, brothers uh, and sisters of faith uh, in, in Christ. Uh, the issue that's come up that he has to now deal with, Paul, is based on a rumor. Uh, there's been a rumor that spread among this church, uh, the early church in Jerusalem, uh, and probably to, to other Jewish folks there as well, of course, is that uh, Paul is out there uh, telling the Jews that live in Western Turkey and in Greece and these other areas that he's been, that when you come to faith in Christ, uh, you can just forget the law of Moses. You don't have to circumcise your children anymore and so forth. And that's very clear that that, uh, that is true among the Gentiles. And James reiterates that. Remember Acts 15 and our letter, and we've said this and so forth. Uh, but this is the rumor that uh, people are being said uh, about you. The same rumor that was spread about Jesus uh, and about Stephen, who becomes the first uh, martyr of the church. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's been said that uh, 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 a, a rumor has, it doesn't have a leg to stand on, but it still runs pretty fast. Uh, there's a, a story that's kind of uh, told in a couple different ways, but in, in an Eastern version, it's of a, a neighbor that spreads a rumor about someone else that causes a lot of damage to their relationship. It uh, circulates uh, through the entire village and so forth. And so it's suggested to her that uh, the only way you can make this right is if you go talk to uh, a particular person in the uh, town, in the village that was known for his great <coughs> wisdom. Uh, she does that. She explains the story. And he says, well, there's one way that you can remedy this situation and make it right. You need to go down to the market. You need to purchase uh, a chicken. And on your way home, all you've got to do is uh, every 10 feet, pull out a couple of feathers and drop them on the ground. Uh, and then once you've done that, come and see me, uh, which she does. And then she comes to see him. And he says, well, there's only one more part now. Now you've got to go back to the marketplace and go back and collect all the feathers. And when you've done that, come and see me. And she says, well, I think the wind's blowing them all away. I think that's impossible. And he says, yes, that's true. What you've done to undo is impossible. You know, once you've cast those feathers to the wind, so to speak, it's very, you're never going to get them back again. So uh, in a sense, it's a, 
It's a problem within the early church that's been uh, based on a rumor and gossip about the Apostle Paul, the same kind of rumor that was spread about Stephen and about Jesus uh, himself. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's really uh, based on the issue of this idea of circumcision. This would be, of course, a huge thing uh, to, uh, to Jewish parents to make sure they continue to uh, circumcise their, their, their little boys. Why? It said that they believed in the Messiah. That was the whole point. Uh, we have as the sign of the new covenant that we're under what we call communion, uh, the bread and the cup that we take, that Jesus says, and this is the sign of the new covenant. We're remembering the covenant that we're under in terms of the relationship with God, which is a, a righteousness that's by faith alone. Uh, preceding this is a covenant given to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people. Uh, and that is a covenant that we say is unconditional and it's eternal. It's still in effect. Uh, God says to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. He makes the promise of, of the land to them uh, that is still in play. Uh, he makes the promise of the seed and all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. That's the Messiah. How will all the nations of the earth be blessed? It's through the Messiah when he comes. So Jewish... Parents, through the years, circumcised their male children as a sign of the covenant with Abraham, believing God would bring the Messiah one day. And though God has brought the Messiah, they believe in that Messiah, and so they're going to continue to circumcise their, uh, their children. Uh, and, uh, and they're saying, though, that Paul's saying, uh, don't do that, you shouldn't do that, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and it becomes a, 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 big, uh, a big issue. Now, Evidence says Paul never did that, uh, never would say that, uh, based on his own, his own life and his own lifestyle. Uh, back in chapter 18, uh, we see him shave his head at that point uh, and take, take a vow uh, to, the, to the Lord and so forth, uh, hoping, and again, hoping to get back to Jerusalem in time for the feast. See, so it's very <laughs> difficult to, sh to shave your head. I just thought I'd mention that. Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, we see him circumcise Timothy. Remember, Timothy's uh, uh, father was, and when it says he was a Greek or a Gentile, it just means he wasn't a believer. Uh, and, but the mother was, uh, and the grandmother, you know, Eunice and, uh, uh, and Lois. Uh, and so Paul wants to take him uh, for the ministry. He wants him to be able to minister uh, as, a, as his mother being a Jew. He's Jewish, but he can't have a ministry or walk into a synagogue or say a thing to a Jewish person unless he's, unless he's been circumcised. It's the sign that he believes in the Messiah. Uh, and so Paul circumcises Timothy, which was no, no small deal, given that Timothy's probably 17 or 18 years old, uh, and there's no hospital. There's uh, no painkillers. You're just going to have to uh, uh, go through it. So he does that. Uh, so Paul in no way... Uh, is saying that Jewish people, when you come to faith in Christ, should suddenly stop being, stop being Jewish. Uh, the, the church has said that for about 2,000 years, unfortunately, which has led to, and about 85% of the people that call themselves Christians around the planet today, has led to a lot of anti-Semitism uh, within, within the church itself. Horrific things done to Jewish people, quote, in the name of Christ, uh, and, uh, and so forth, and some horrible things. Now, what was interesting... Uh, is in my reading this week. I like to think I read some pretty, some pretty good commentaries and some guys that I really respect and so forth. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I just, you know, I obviously read the text through several times, uh, you know, on my own uh, as, I, as I prepare. I kind of break it down. I do my outline and stuff. I think about cross-references. I might do a few word studies. Uh, so I'm pretty well into the process here before I ever start to uh, uh, read somebody else's opinion. And of course, um, if, I, if I read that, uh, that what, what I think it says is different than everybody else, I better re-examine my position. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, I, so anyway, by the time I get to the commentaries, uh, I'm reading this week uh, guys that I really love and respect and so forth. Man, they, they're talking about how controversial uh, this whole thing is and this plan for the Apostle Paul. Uh, and uh, what a huge mistake it was and so forth. And I just thought... Wow, I just didn't get that, you know, and, uh, and just uh, re reading through it and studying it. So uh, it, it became uh, even more interesting to me. I began to probably read even a little more than I would normally. It's like, I can't believe that guy said that. Wow, that guy says that. Well, that guy says something similar. It was like, uh, it was kind of shocking. 
Uh, that's what we're seeing here in terms of Paul's arrival and this concern because of a rumor uh, needed a solution. So uh, again, the solution uh, is that, uh, verse 23, uh, we have four men, James speaking here, who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concern you are nothing. So uh, again, we're reminded of uh, uh, the, how, many, how many Jewish people are into the city at this time. We're reminded uh, also of when he says, and myriads of Jews have you know, basically come to faith in Christ, uh, even that myriads. Okay, this is where I turn over to my NIV. Thousands, thank you. you know, don't use that word a lot. Myriads of tourists have come to Waikiki <laughs> this week. Uh, we, we still don't use that word, but uh, thousands. Uh, and we're, uh, you know, we think about Josephus, uh, again, Jewish historian, kind of sold out to the Romans, not a good guy in that sense, but he's with the Romans, writing history for them, uh, and writes a lot in the first century, and uh, of what has taken place and so forth. Uh, it says that by 70 AD, uh, there's 100,000 uh, Jewish believers of Jesus uh, in Jerusalem at that time. Uh, he, even if he's given a little bit of exaggeration, that's still, that's still a lot. So when, uh, when uh, uh, it's recorded here that there are thousands, we don't know how many thousands, but man, God's doing a, a tremendous work uh, there in Jerusalem. Not only of Paul as he's out church planting uh, there in Greece and in Western Turkey uh, and uh, in other areas, but uh, uh, here as well. But it's kind of a problem because of this rumor that's been spread uh, among them. Uh, so again, here's the solution. We want you to take a vow. What kind of a vow was it? Doesn't say. Just a vow. But some have suggested it's a Nazarite vow. Therefore, the shave the head and so forth. And you know, for 30 days, you're going to you know not drink wine, not do this, not do that. It's a separation. I'm going to separate myself unto the Lord for a special period of time of dedication and so forth. That may have been it. It doesn't really sing. The idea of purification. Uh, again, we don't always kind of track along with some of these things. That typically would be seven days. Uh, that would be. Uh, because of something as simple of having touched the dead body, uh, which was obviously a big deal. It made you unclean. Maybe there's a death in the family. Somebody's got to help. Somebody's got to prepare the body. Somebody's got to do the burial. Now I'm unclean. Now I need to go to the, to the temple. I need to go through a purification. Uh, and I need to uh, make sure I'm clean. Uh, and of course, the, the Jews have always practiced this, uh, which is why... Uh, they, uh, they didn't suffer near as many deaths during the black plague, we call the black plague in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, because uh, when somebody died, they were very careful about the body, uh, they got it buried right away, they washed themselves, they cleansed themselves, they had no contact with others and so forth. It kept that disease from, from uh, spreading. Unfortunately, what that did then is that because they weren't dying, uh, they, some did, of course, but they weren't dying at the same kind of numbers and rates as, uh, as Gentiles were. So they got blamed for the plague, which had nothing to do with them. Uh, they began to be persecuted, and then they were driven out of Western uh, Europe into Eastern Europe uh, in huge numbers, where they would be there and reside there for a number of years until a guy named Adolf Hitler comes along, and he can trap them in Eastern Europe and try to uh, annihilate them. Uh, I'm not a much of a conspiracy guy, but there is a conspiracy by Satan, of course, to go after uh, God's people, the, Jew the Jewish people. He knows the end of the story. He knows that in the end, it's the Jewish people that cry out for the Messiah. And that's what brings them back to planet Earth. If he can eliminate them, then he can break the cycle and end the story and continue to reign himself. And he's been attempting to do it for many years. But it's unfortunate how uh, at this early juncture, this becomes such a controversial thing, even of really good evangelical writers to say that this was the biggest mistake that the Apostle Paul ever made in his life. Why? Because he did something Jewish. You know, it's uh, even, uh, even in a lot of your translations. Well, you'll see that uh, in the end of our text, when Paul gets up to speak to the crowd, it says that he spoke to them in Hebrew, which is why they went, oh, and they're going to listen to them. This guy has an education uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but a lot of translations will say, and he spoke to them in Aramaic. They'll say Jesus spoke from the cross in Aramaic. No, he didn't. He spoke in Hebrew. 
Uh, you know, it's just interesting how even uh, you can flip to the, the, the map in your, your Bible, and it might even say Palestine in the days of Jesus. No, I'm sorry, that was Israel. That word doesn't even come along until 100, 130 A.D. Uh, but uh, it's just very interesting that this becomes so, so controversial. This is just what Paul did, and he describes it and why he does it in writing to first, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 12. He says, for though I am free from all men, uh, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without law, uh, not being without law towards God. He doesn't go out and sin or do anything, but under the law towards Christ. That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things uh, to all men that by all means uh, save some. So that was Paul's MO. He would blend in as best he could wherever he went as a missionary. Uh, but the fact that he had put his faith in Jesus as a Messiah didn't mean that he was no longer Jewish. <laughs> and shouldn't uh, act like he, uh, he, was, uh, he was Jewish. So he had no problem, you know, Paul, uh, and, and by the way, he says, yeah, and then you, you pay for all the offerings for these four guys as well. <clears throat> but we don't hear any grumbling about that of Paul. It's just that he's, he's like, yeah, this is not an issue, no problem. Uh, his whole heart for what's taking place here is, uh, is really described in Romans 9, where he says, I told the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing with, with, witness with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul's saying, if I could do it, I would trade my salvation if they could get saved. Now, again, he knows that's not possible. Uh, this is just the, the rabbi speaking here. <clears throat> and uh, in uh, what we call hyperbole, it's like that the big, the big exaggeration. Jesus did it all the time. Rich men entering heaven, it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. That's hyperbole. You know, that's not going to happen. It's exaggeration for a point. And his exaggeration here is for the point of saying that that uh, this is my heart. If I'm the apostle, I'm called to the Gentiles. I'm going to be faithful to that. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, I trade my own salvation if the Jewish people would open their eyes to the, the, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. So Paul's arrival is uh, met with joy uh, and gladness uh, and to hear the whole report in, uh, in detail. Uh, James is certainly there with the elders. Uh, we don't know how many, but uh, it's probably a pretty uh, large group of individuals that are hearing this report. Uh, and it had to be some relief to the Apostle Paul that they're, they're all kind of stoked at uh, the work he's doing among the Gentiles. But there's a problem, there's a concern, it's, and it's uh, based on a rumor that's being spread among these believers, uh, and that is uh, primarily Paul is telling uh, Jewish parents out there uh, in those areas he's been to because there are now believers in Jesus and they're part of churches that uh, have Gentiles in them. They no longer should uh, circumcise their, their male kids, and uh, that's really at the heart of the issue. James comes up with a, a solution here that... Uh, uh, seems uh, seems like a good one. Uh, that is, go do something really Jewish <laughs> and really obvious to everybody. It even involves shaving your head. Apparently, guys didn't do that a lot. So, when some guy walked around with his uh, a head shaved. It was like, whoa, okay, that guy just uh, took a vow. We know what he's doing there. So, so Paul's like, yeah, I'm all in. I'll, I'll do that. I'll pay for the uh, uh, the various uh, offerings and so forth. These aren't offerings, you know, for forgiveness of sins. There's a one time for all sacrifice for our sins, Jesus Christ. These are, these are grain offerings and so forth that would accompany this uh, idea of, of purification. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, many writers, uh, leaders that you would be familiar with, think this was like the biggest mistake Paul ever made in his life. He was compromising the gospel and so forth. Uh, but again, this is all just... Uh, this is all part of the problem of the, of the church not heeding the warning of the Apostle Paul uh, there in, uh, in Romans chapter uh, 9, 10, and 11, where he says, you need to remember, writing to the church at Rome that was primarily Jews, but had Gentiles in it also, uh, that the Gentiles need to remember that it's, uh, Judaism is like a natural olive tree. 
Uh, the Gentiles coming in are like a wild olive tree that's been grafted in. Uh, wild uh, olive trees cannot, cannot produce any fruit at all. You could take a natural olive tree and graft it into a wild one, it'll start to produce fruit. But never the other way around. So the idea of the Gentiles being joined with the Jewish people uh, in this faith in the Jewish Messiah, they'll bear fruit, and it'll be a miracle of God, because it will just never happen naturally. Uh, and this is the mystery not known before the church would be made up of Jews and Gentiles together. So there's the warning. The warning is the Gentiles, don't forget that you've been grafted in. Don't forget your roots uh, and where you've come from. And, uh, and by and large, we've forgotten that for 2,000 years. Uh, and, um, and everything uh, then uh, plays into this anti-Semitism that is uh, uh, raising its head again in the world today. Just in the headlines early this morning, probably uh, late yesterday in Jerusalem, uh, Secretary of uh, State Kerry uh, made the comment uh, that has uh, infuriated people uh, in uh, Israel today, saying that uh, the problem with ISIS uh, and their recruiting or the ability to recruit is a Jewish problem. He said the problem is because Israel uh, will not settle with the Palestinians over their two-state solution because they won't do that. That angers the people in the streets and the young Arabs, and they go and join ISIS as a result of that. ISIS, that's a Jewish problem. This is classic. This is classic. This is the Black Plague. That was a Jewish problem. Uh, it's unbelievable. So there's a few people in Israel that are uh, a, li a little upset uh, today. Uh, this has been the history uh, of the Jewish people. Uh, Ezekiel prophesied that there'll come a day when all the nations of the earth will turn against Israel and against the Jewish people. There'll be a cup of trembling. And boy, we are, we are approaching their, that day. There's only a, uh, there's only a few uh, that still call them a, a friend and ally. <clears throat> members of Congress, both sides of the aisle, uh, uh, totally support the nation of Israel. That's not where this is coming from. It's just coming from the uh, administration itself. And uh, we need to continue to, to pray. Pray for our leaders that God would open their eyes. Pray for their salvation. Pray that God would give them uh, wisdom and continue to pray for the peace uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, but this issue and this problem here uh, is, uh, is something that... Uh, uh, as I read about it today by really good men that write very good commentaries 2,000 years later, they think this is a big issue because Paul's going to do something Jewish. It's uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, secondly, uh, Paul is apprehended by a mob uh, in the temple. That's verse 26 to 30. Then Paul took men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the uh, expiration of the days of purification, usually seven days in which a time uh, an offering should be made for each uh, one of them. Uh, now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! Uh, this is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, uh, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, uh, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately shut, uh, the doors were shut. So uh, Paul is apprehended. Notice I'm saying from uh, men from uh, Ephesus that uh, recognize him. Now the text says uh, men from Asia, very generic. Again, this is a Roman province of Asia. It's not really Asia uh, as we know it today. It's uh, uh, western Turkey. Uh, but notice that uh, they recognized Trophimus, and he's from Ephesus. Uh, I don't think he was a famous football player or anything. So, you know, so if they recognize him, they got to be from, from, from that town, uh, which kind of helps us understand what's, uh, uh, what's going on up here. Uh, notice, for again, verse 29, they had seen Trophimus, uh, uh, the Ephesian, uh, with him uh, in the city. Now, remember when Paul was in Ephesian, uh, Ephesus, the first time he goes there, uh, there was this little riot, only had like 30 to 50,000 people you know, in the amphitheater, great as Diana, you know, for two hours, and that's all going on. That's all stirred up, you know, against the Apostle Paul and his uh, uh, preaching the gospel and, and so forth. 
uh, in the middle, in the middle of that riot, then the, some of the Jewish people have gone in there. You know, Paul starts in the synagogue, does the best he can until he's kicked out of there, and then he reaches whoever he can reach with the gospel. Uh, the Jews that reject the gospel, some of them are in the amphitheater on that occasion. Now, they're afraid that somehow they're going to get <coughs> associated with Paul <coughs> because, he's, because he's Jewish, and they want to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. Excuse me. So verse 33 of chapter 19 says, <clears throat> And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, this is in the middle of the amphitheater, uh, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was uh, a Jew, uh, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So he didn't get to say a word. <clears throat> he would want to say, we're with you guys. Yeah, yeah, we want to see these guys killed as well because they're, they're creating problems for us. We don't agree with them and so, so forth. But it doesn't go well. <clears throat> but apparently this guy, Alexander, the coppersmith, he doesn't really go away. And, and Paul, when he's in the uh, Mamertine prison in Rome, at the end of his life, writing back to Timothy, who ends up pastoring this uh, church in Ephesus for a period of time, reminds him there in 2 Timothy 4.14, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he greatly re resisted our words. The guys in Ephesus hated Paul, the Jews that were there. It's the day of Pentecost. There are Jews there from Asia, from, uh, from Ephesus. And some of them, we know who they are because they recognize Trophimus. They see the apostle Paul. Uh, he's in there going through his rites of purification. They don't care what he's doing there. They just see the opportunity. We couldn't kill him then. We couldn't turn the mob against them then. We can do it now. We're with our own people. All we've got to do is say, he brought a Gentile in here. People will go crazy over, uh, over this, uh, this whole thing. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what, uh, what, he, what he does. So he's, uh, secondly, he's apprehended uh, because... It is believed he brought a Gentile into the court of the men. Now there's a sign uh, over that gate that says no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught so doing will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Yes, the death penalty. Uh, was it uh, carried out? Yes, it was. And we know that it was even carried out under Roman rule. Now again, the Antonio Fortress is above. Uh, they can look down. It's a feast day. They're on high alert. They're watching the activities and what's going on so that when this riot breaks out with Paul and they grab him, they shut the, the gates to the outside. And, and, uh, they're not going to rough him up a little. They're, they're attempting to kill him. And that, that, that's just to say historically that had done, uh, had been done. The Romans had allowed the Jews to do that on other occasions. Uh, and that's what it's happening to the Apostle Paul here. So he arrives in Jerusalem, there's joy, there's gladness, they're happy about what's going on, uh, there's a concern, uh, there's a plan where Paul could uh, really demonstrate and show to the people, especially the believers that, that are right there in Jerusalem, among which there are thousands, that, uh, man, he's still, he's still Jewish, you know, and he's still following the law and all this. No, again, he's not following the law because it has something to do with his salvation. And Paul's very clear that, as he says, <laughs> circumcision is nothing. It's the circumcision of the heart that counts. Uh, this is, so we don't want to get confused here. He's doing what he can do to try to reach people that he loved with the gospel. Uh, and if uh, that means that, uh, that he uh, uh, needs to wear a coat and tie on Sunday, because that's what everybody does where he's at, that he's going to do that. Uh, if it means, you know, whatever it means. He's going to make some social adjustments uh, and so forth. And again, Paul's raised a Pharisee. It's not hard for him to be Jewish, to try to reach that Jewish people. It's not what they have to do. It's what can I do to reach others? How can I adjust my behavior uh, and so forth in order to reach more people with, uh, with the gospel? You know, when Sammy was here last, last week, he was talking about uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood took over. And how they went in and started uh, uh, torching the churches and killing Christians and so forth. Uh, and then after they were taken out, because uh, more than half of the city took to the streets to protest uh, their, uh, the government they were living under, 
uh, the moderate Muslims were watching as the Christians got up on national television and forgave, just like the video clip we just saw. They forgave the people that killed their family members. And they saw a contrast between humility and pride, uh, be, between kindness uh, and, uh, and violence and, uh, and anger. Uh, and that contrast between these two groups of people is what is leading to Muslims coming to faith in Christ uh, even today uh, in Egypt. Uh, it's the contrast that we're seeing here uh, with the Apostle Paul, how he's going to deal with this mob as he finally get, is able to get up and get a word in edgewise. Well, let's look at the commander of the Antonio Fortress and how he responds to the riot. This, uh, this man will meet a little more next week uh, in terms of uh, his position, a little more about his character. But verse 31 says, Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked uh, who he was and what he had done. Uh, and some of the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, uh, away with him. Now, by the way, it's the same place and the same steps where they cried that about Jesus, away with him, crucif crucify him. I don't know if those words uh, echoed in anybody's uh, head on that, this particular day. Verse 37, then as uh, Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Uh, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Uh, but Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. Uh, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew language, saying, uh, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense uh, before you now. And we'll, we'll look at that uh, defense next time. But uh, again, the commander from the Antonio Fortress arrived. About a thousand, a thousand soldiers uh, in that, uh, that fortress. Uh, the captain is Claudius Lysias, and uh, it says there's two centurions. So uh, uh, that's, uh, well, it says plural. So there's at least two. Uh, could be more. Uh, they've each got uh, at least 100, uh, 100 soldiers with them. So there's minimally uh, 200 soldiers, maybe more, uh, that are rushed down. Again, off uh, those steps from the Antonio Fortress, right, uh, in a sense, down on the deck, right there on the, on the Temple Mount, uh, to get to the Apostle uh, Paul. And uh, what the commander does next is try to establish the, the identity. He thinks Paul's some Egyptian guy that has led this revolt and so forth. That's why he throws chains on him. Thinks he's some uh, uh, dangerous assassin or something uh, right away and, uh, and everything. And then he uh, tries to ascertain uh, Paul's uh, identity. Of course, Paul begins to speak to him in Greek, which kind of shocks him uh, that, uh, that he speaks Greek uh, and uh, uh, begins to uh, engage him in conversation. He says, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm from uh, uh, Tarsus, you know, Cilicia and so forth, uh, uh, which was a free city. It doesn't mean that he, he's not saying to him, I'm a Roman citizen. But kind of, he'll, he'll save that trump card, you know, for, uh, for another time. But it does mean the commander better listen to what he has to say. This is not who he thought it was. Uh, and this could go very badly for him uh, if he's uh, arresting a guy that should not be uh, being arrested. Now, we would say that at this point, <laughs> <clears throat> what uh, Agabus prophesied, well, it happened exactly the way he said it would happen. Uh, Paul was warned uh, that it would happen uh, in this way. Paul's only concern seems to be, can I just speak to the crowd? And we have to picture in mind, again, this crowd wasn't like uh, trying to rough him up a little bit because they didn't really like what they were trying to kill him. <clears throat> so he's beat to a pulp. You know, he's probably bleeding from his face and his head. Uh, and so forth. I don't know if he could stand, if he could walk, but, he, but he's, he's in bad shape. I, I read one commentary and said, you know, it's actually uh, impossible for Paul to have done this. Nobody could get beat like this and then stand on those stairs and say what Paul said. 
Well, uh, they would say that that young guy we saw in the video clip, that would be impossible for him to go back in uh, and with tears uh, pray for and forgive the, the person that beat and tortured his grandmother to death before his very eyes. But he did it uh, because that's, that's the power of the gospel. Uh, and, uh, and Paul is able to do this. Now, writing letter, a letter later to, uh, to Ephesus, again, the, the area where these guys were from, the city that they were from, uh, Paul uh, mentions this idea of, uh, of being in chains, uh, and in chains, his big desire, I'd be able to preach the gospel with boldness and with clarity and so forth. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's over in Ephesians 6.19. He says, that for me, uh, that utterance may give, be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that uh, he may comfort your, your heart. You have to kind of wonder, okay, so Tychicus is with them. He's one of the guys, if you go back and kind of keep track of the book of Acts, he's not there on the Temple Mount, he's a great guy, but he's in the city, He's well aware of what Paul's doing. Uh, certainly we've become well aware of everything that happened to the Apostle Paul. Paul's writing uh, much later now. Hey, pray for that I'll have boldness. I'm in chains here. I want to be able to preach the gospel. Similar si uh, situation as we're seeing here. Uh, so how, how does that, and this guy Tai Chi is showing up with this letter, how is that supposed to be a great encouragement to the church? I hope this will encourage you. I'm in prison. <laughs> But pray that I'll be, you know, bold in whatever uh, shot I've got uh, in sharing the gospel. Paul knew that he was in the center of God's will. And he knew that God was in control of all of these events, uh, even the events as he stood on the steps uh, and now is going to be given an opportunity to say something to this crowd that just tried to kill him. Uh, what is he going to say? He believes it's all for a reason. It's all for a, a purpose. Again, at this uh, juncture in, in the story, uh, it would seem like things have gone very badly. That perhaps it was a mistake for the Apostle Paul to go back to Jerusalem. But if, God was, but if Paul was in the center of God's will, why in the world would God allow this to happen to the Apostle Paul? And uh, I know that none of us have ever done that, you know, question God about why he's doing, but we probably know other people that have had, uh, and we often uh, know people that think that God does make mistakes, uh, and he would have never allowed this to happen to me or this person if he was really loving and caring. Well, uh, again, we, we do question in, the, in those times. And, um, and it's because we're still in the middle of the story. You know, what will Paul say exactly? Will he be released? Be, be released? How will he get out of Jerusalem? God said that he would uh, appear uh, in Rome and share the gospel. How will he ever get to Rome? Even if he makes it to Caesarea, what will happen next? He'll still have to come back next week and find out what. <laughs> See, there's more of the story. You have to keep coming back. There's more of the story. That's the point. It may not look too good right now, but there's more of the story. This is not the end of the story. And so often we're in the middle of the story when we are questioning God the most. And he's just saying, I still love you and I still have a plan for your life. And you're just in the middle and you're just going to have to hang in there uh, and trust me. And certainly uh, the Apostle Paul uh, does that here as we'll see next week. Now Jesus also tells us how to react to persecution as Paul does uh, here by example. In Matthew 5.10, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against uh, you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, so that they persecuted the prophets uh, who were before you. And uh, uh, we're, we're now living uh, in those days, in a sense. We never thought we'd see the persecution of Christians for their faith in Jesus Christ in this country. Uh, but it's really stepped up uh, in, the, in the last four or five years. Uh, there is the secular humanist view that Christians should be tolerated in their places of worship as long as they never bring it out publicly or say anything or try to impose their beliefs upon uh, anyone else. So there's a, there's a war, in a sense, that's very real, and there's a very, very much a spiritual war that's, uh, that's taking place. 
uh, how, how do we react to it? Well, according to Jesus, we react to it by having Paul's example in his words that we're to have a, uh, we're, we actually can rejoice over it if, if we have a, an eternal perspective. If our life is about now, then uh, it's going to be pretty dismal. If our life is about heaven and eternity, uh, we'll be able to deal with it uh, in a much better way. Uh, and uh, it arrived in a way uh, this week in the news that uh, even I, I was shocked about. Let me uh, introduce you to somebody else here. This is Anise Parker. She's the mayor, mayor of Houston. She got elected a few years ago uh, with a, a very low voter uh, turnout. There's a little lesson in that, certainly. And uh, she's a mayor. She's the first open uh, lesbian mayor, mayor of, that, uh, of that city. Uh, once uh, she kind of uh, got uh, city council uh, situated, she uh, uh, had a what was called at the time a bathroom bill passed. The bathroom bill uh, says that basically, if today you feel like you're a woman, even though you're a guy, then you can use the women's bathroom. Uh, if you're a woman today, you feel like you're a guy, you can use the guy's bathroom. Uh, there's a, there's been a few a few cities that have passed uh, similar uh, measures around the country. Well, again, this was passed through the city council. It wasn't a big vote or anything. So uh, Christians weren't real thrilled about that for some reason. Uh, dads didn't like the idea of their, their little girls uh, in using uh, the, the bathroom. And, and any, any guy that wanted to could just go in there. Call me crazy? I think that's a bad idea. And, uh, and so they started a petition drive uh, to get this thing, a referendum to get it on, uh, on as a vote. Uh, several churches, of course, got involved. And uh, they needed uh, about 15,000 signatures. They, they got uh, about 45,000. They got tripled. So they were felt assured it would uh, then be on the ballot. But the mayor's office determined that uh, too many of those signatures were faulty and suspect. So there wasn't enough to put it on the ballot. Uh, and so uh, they began uh, some kind of litigation uh, and complaint uh, and so forth against that to determine why in the world is this not on the ballot. Uh, she then, uh, you know, basically her next step was this week, she, sus su she subpoenaed all of the sermons, uh, all the text messages, all of the emails, and all the communication uh, of five pastors uh, in a fairly large churches in Houston, uh, and she wanted all of that uh, turned over to her, her attorneys and her offices. Actually, according to the Alliance Defending Freedom, there were 17 different uh, categories, even, and even including uh, personal communication, verbal communication between congregants, people in the church, and the pastor uh, that had anything to do with homosexuality, her, uh, or, or any of these categories, or the bathroom bill. Of course, this is uh, trampling down the first two, uh, you know, uh, you know, the Constitution and the first two Bill of Rights, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom uh, took the case, uh, and they believe they'll, they'll go to court, ask the judge to quash uh, the, the subpoenas, and it'll all go away. Uh, they're assuming that the attorneys uh, for the city of Houston went to law school. They're, they're assuming that. Uh, they're actually assuming that they may be familiar with the Constitution. They're assuming that. Uh, and therefore, they're assuming they know they don't have a legal leg to stand on. So why do this? It's just bullying. You know, look what I can do to you, say to you, and say, uh, say about you. Uh, but uh, it, it kind of has risen the level of persecution to a, a very, very high level. I, I, this is a, a Tony Perkins quote. I, uh, I get his little newsletters. and Sorry, but I love the sarcasm sometimes. Houston is home to one of uh, NASA's most sophisticated space centers, uh, but even it would have trouble finding signs of intelligence in the local mayor's office. <laughs> the city's highest official is blowing past the First Amendment at warp speed and lighting a power keg uh, in the process. Um, I saw uh, uh, Governor Huckabee's show um, last night. Uh, he talked about this uh, and uh, in his kind of opening statements. And uh, his suggestion I thought was very good. He was saying, He's saying, I'm going to put uh, uh, Mayor Parker's uh, address uh, on the screen here for you. Uh, and I'm just asking you pastors out there in the United States, if she wants a sermon, give her a sermon. Will, will you each send her one of your sermons this week? I'm hoping she'll get thousands. She, and he says, you know, there's a lot of Christians that if she's interested in sermons, she'd probably love a Bible. So maybe we could uh, send her some Bibles uh, as, as well. Uh, I just thought it was a great, a great response uh, to uh, to this whole thing. 
I'm also, like a lot of other people, are hoping that uh, this will, you know, change uh, the, the view of evangelical Christians. There's about 80 million evangelical Christians in the United States. <coughs> only half are registered to vote. Only half of them vote. And in a midterm election, only half of them vote. Uh, so in a sense, they're in Houston, they're getting what, what they asked for or didn't ask for by uh, just not being part of the process. So, uh, you know, we can't account for everybody, all Christians around the world, around the state or whatever, but man, we need to go out and, uh, and vote for the people that will uh, at least, even if they're not of our faith, they will at least respect uh, our, our faith uh, and our right for our voice to be heard in, in, in a public square. And if we don't do it, there's another side that want, wants to make us all go away. Uh, and uh, uh, they're, they're pretty uh, determined to, uh, to do that. But uh, persecution, different ways. Paul certainly getting, getting the, uh, the full brunt of it in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, beat within an inch of his life. Uh, but we'll look next time at uh, how he deals with it, how he reacts to it. And I think he reacts to it in, a, in an incredible way. Uh, like like Christians we're seeing around the world, like the video clip uh, we saw earlier this morning, because they believe that God is there. He is on the throne. He does have a plan. Uh, when it looks at its darkest, it's simply because we're still in the middle of the story. Uh, we're not at the end of the story yet. By the way, we win in the end. Jesus does come back and establish his, uh, his kingdom. And as uh, Sammy said uh, uh, to a couple of us last week, and I'm so excited because Satan won't be there. <laughs> Pretty excited about that as well. <laughs>